I had been hiking alone through a dense forest in the Pacific Northwest. This trip was supposed to help me clear my head. Life had been stressful lately, and I needed some time away from everything. Work, noise, people. The forest was perfect, quiet, peaceful, and far from any distractions. I started my hike three days ago. The trail was rough in some places, but I didn't mind. I had my gear, food, and a map. My plan was to hike for five days, camp each night, and then loop back to my starting point. It was all going well, at least until that third night. By late afternoon, I found a good spot to set up camp near a small stream. I pitched my tent, gathered some wood, and started a fire. As the sun went down, the air grew colder, but I didn't mind. I made myself dinner, a packet of freeze-dried chili, and sat by the fire enjoying the quiet. It was around 9 p.m. when I heard the sound. At first, it was faint, just a crunch of leaves somewhere behind me. I thought it was probably an animal. Deer were common in these woods, and I'd even seen a rabbit earlier in the day. But then I heard it again closer this time. It wasn't just the sound of something moving. It sounded like footsteps. Hello, I called out. My voice echoed in the stillness. No answer. I stood up and shined my flashlight toward the trees. The beam cut through the darkness, but I couldn't see anything. Maybe it was nothing, I thought. I tried to shake off the unease and sat back down, forcing myself to focus on the warmth of the fire. But the footsteps came again. This time, they stopped just at the edge of the clearing. My heart started racing. I turned on my headlamp and scanned the area. That's when I saw him. A man was standing just beyond the circle of light. He wasn't moving, just staring at me. His clothes were dark, blending into the shadows, and I couldn't make out his face clearly. But his presence sent a chill down my spine. Can I help you? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He didn't respond. He didn't move. He just stood there, watching me. I reached for my bear spray, my hands trembling. Hey, I'm armed. You need to leave. I shouted, hoping to scare him off. Still, he didn't move. But then, slowly, he smiled. It wasn't a friendly smile. It was cold, almost like he was amused. My stomach dropped. I held up my flashlight and pointed it directly at him. The bright beam hit his face, and for a second, I thought he might react. But instead, he turned around and walked back into the trees, disappearing into the darkness without a sound. I stood there, frozen my heart pounding in my chest. Who was he? Why had he been watching me? I couldn't answer those questions, but I knew one thing for sure. I wasn't safe. I didn't sleep that night. I kept the fire going and sat with the bear spray in one hand and my flashlight in the other. Every rustle of leaves made me jump. At first light, I packed up my camp as quickly as I could. I didn't bother eating breakfast. I just wanted to get out of there. As I started hiking back, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. Every so often, I'd stop and listen, but the forest was silent. Still, I couldn't ignore the uneasy sensation creeping up my spine. About two hours into my hike, I noticed something that made my blood run cold. In the soft dirt of the trail, I saw footprints, mine heading back toward the trailhead, and his overlapping mine. He had followed me. I quickened my pace, practically jogging now. My legs ached, and my lungs burned, but I didn't stop. I kept looking over my shoulder, half expecting to see him standing there again. By the time I reached the parking lot, I was drenched in sweat and shaking. My car was the only one there, just as I'd left it. I threw my gear into the back seat, got in, and locked the doors. As I drove away, I kept glancing in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see him standing at the edge of the lot, watching me. But there was nothing. I never reported the incident. What could I say? That a man had watched me and followed me in the woods? No crime had been committed. But I've never gone hiking alone again. The forest, 
once my place of peace, now feels like a place where I'm never truly alone. Last summer, I went hiking alone in a forest I had visited many times before. It was one of my favorite places, a mix of well-marked trails and dense, untouched wilderness. Hiking gave me peace. I loved the quiet of the woods, the fresh air, and the sense of being far away from everything. That day started like any other hike. I had my backpack, water, snacks, and a map of the trails. The weather was perfect, clear skies and just cool enough to keep me from sweating too much. I planned to stick to one of the longer trails, one that looped back to the parking area by evening. About an hour into the hike, I noticed something unusual. There was a narrow dirt path branching off from the main trail. It was faint, almost hidden by the underbrush, and there was no sign or marker to show it was part of the official trail system. Normally, I would have ignored it, but something about the path caught my curiosity. It looked like it had been used recently. There were no weeds growing over it, and I could see faint footprints in the dirt. I told myself I'd only follow it for a little while and turn back if it led nowhere. The deeper I went, the quieter the forest became. At first, I didn't notice, but then it hit me. There were no birds chirping, no rustling leaves, no sounds at all. Felt wrong, like the woods were holding their breath. But I shook off the feeling. Maybe I was just imagining things. After about half an hour of walking, the trail opened into a small clearing. In the center of the clearing stood a cabin. It was old and rough, like something out of a horror movie. The wood was weathered, the roof sagged, and the windows were dark and empty. But the strangest part was the porch. Hanging from strings were animal bones, small ones like from rabbits or squirrels. They swung gently in the breeze, making a soft, clinking sound. I should have turned back right then, but curiosity got the better of me. I walked closer, my boots crunching on the dry leaves. The closer I got, the worse I felt. My chest felt tight, and every instinct told me to leave but I ignored it. When I reached the cabin, I peered through the window. Inside, the room was dimly lit by sunlight filtering through cracks in the walls. What I saw made my stomach churn. There was a pile of clothes in one corner, dirty, torn, and definitely human. On the table was a large, blood-stained knife, its blade reflecting the faint light. My mind raced with questions. Who lived here? Why were their clothes? Whose were they? I took a step back, trying to process what I was seeing, when I heard something behind me. It was faint, but unmistakable. The sound of footsteps on dry leaves. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. Slowly, I turned around, but I didn't see anyone. The woods were empty, or at least they seemed to be. I told myself it was just my imagination. Maybe an animal had wandered nearby. But then I noticed something that made my blood run cold. The footsteps were coming closer. I didn't wait to see who or what was making the sound. I turned and ran, sprinting back the way I had come. My legs felt heavy and my lungs burned, but I didn't stop. I could still hear the footsteps behind me, keeping pace with my own. When I finally reached the main trail, I stopped and looked back. The unmarked path was gone. There was no sign of it, no opening in the trees, nothing. It was as if the trail had never existed. I didn't understand how that was possible. I was sure I had come from that direction. My heart raced as I looked around, expecting to see someone or something emerge from the trees. But the forest was empty. I hurried back to the parking lot, constantly looking over my shoulder. Every crack of a branch or rustle of leaves made me jump. When I finally reached my car, I locked the doors and sat there for a long time, trying to calm down. I didn't report what I saw. Who would believe me? A mysterious cabin with animal bones and a blood-stained knife? 
a trail that disappeared? It all sounded crazy even to me, but the experience has stayed with me. I still love hiking, but I've never gone back to that forest. Sometimes, late at night, I think about the cabin and the pile of clothes. I wonder who or what was following me that day. And most of all, I wonder if someone else will find that unmarked trail, or if it will find them. I was new to search and rescue work, and this was my first mission. I joined the team because I loved the outdoors and wanted to help people. But I didn't know that my very first assignment would stick with me forever. The call came in about a missing hiker in a national park. A man in his early 30s had gone out alone and hadn't returned when he was supposed to. His family reported him missing after they couldn't reach him for two days. The park rangers suspected he might be lost in a remote part of the forest, so our team was sent to search. We split into groups and started covering different areas. The forest was dense, with tall trees blocking most of the sunlight. The ground was uneven, covered in roots and rocks, and the silence was unsettling. Occasionally, I would hear the chirping of birds or the rustle of leaves, but mostly it was just the crunch of my boots and the sound of my breathing. After a few hours of searching, I spotted something unusual through the trees. It was a tent, bright blue and clearly not part of the natural surroundings. My heart raced as I approached it, thinking we might have found the missing hiker. But as I got closer, I realized something wasn't right. The tent looked weathered, with patches of moss growing on the fabric. Yet, it didn't seem like it had been there for long. The zipper was open, and inside, I saw a sleeping bag, a small pile of canned food, and some other camping gear. I called out, Hello? Is anyone here? No response. I carefully stepped closer and peered into the tent. That's when I saw the journal. It was lying on top of the sleeping bag, its cover damp but not damaged. I picked it up and flipped through the pages. Most of the entries were about the hiker's trip, descriptions of the scenery, the animals he'd seen, and how peaceful he felt being away from the world. But the last entry stopped me cold. I think someone is following me. I can hear them at night, circling the tent. If something happens to me, please find my parents. The date on the entry was two days ago. A chill ran down my spine as I looked around. The forest felt too quiet. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. I called my team leader on the radio and reported what I had found. They told me to stay put and wait for the others to arrive. While I waited, I looked around the campsite for any other clues. There were no signs of a struggle, no torn clothing, no blood, nothing but there was something eerie about how untouched everything seemed. It was as if the hiker had just vanished, leaving his tent behind. I kept glancing into the trees, feeling uneasy. The forest around me seemed darker, even though it was the middle of the day. Every sound, every snapping twig or rustling leaf made me jump. When the rest of the team arrived, we searched the area thoroughly. We combed through the surrounding woods, calling the hiker's name and looking for any signs of him. But there was nothing, no footprints, no belongings, no trail to follow. The only clue we had was the journal, with its chilling final entry. After hours of searching, we had to call it a day. The team decided to set up a base camp nearby and continue the search the next morning. Couldn't sleep that night. The journal's words kept playing in my mind. I think someone is following me. Was it an animal? Another person? Or was the hiker just imagining things? I didn't have any answers, but the uncertainty was eating away at me. The next day, we searched again, expanding our area, but the forest gave us nothing. After several days, the official search was called off. The hiker was declared missing, and the case was left open. 
I've thought about that tent and the journal every day since then. I can't stop wondering what happened to the hiker. Did he get lost trying to run from something? Was someone really following him? Or did something else happen out there in the woods? Even now, I can't forget the way the forest felt that day. It wasn't just quiet. It was like it was hiding something. I've been on other search and rescue missions since then, but none have left me feeling the way this one did. I still love the outdoors, but I'm more cautious now. I stick to marked trails and I always go with someone else. Because no matter how peaceful the forest might seem, I know now that it can hold secrets, ones that might never be found. Camping was something my best friend Mike and I loved doing. We had been going on camping trips since we were teenagers, and we always stuck to the same routine. We'd pick a spot in the woods, far from the city, set up camp, and spend the night talking about life, dreams, and random nonsense. It was something simple that we enjoyed together. That trip felt like any other. We packed our gear, drove out to the forest, and hiked for a few hours until we found the perfect spot. A small clearing surrounded by tall trees. It was quiet, peaceful, and far from any trails or other people. By the time the sun started setting, we had our tent pitched, the fire roaring, and our sleeping bags ready. Mike and I sat by the fire, roasting marshmallows and laughing about old memories. We talked about everything, from work stress to Mike's latest failed attempts at dating. At around 10 p.m., the forest grew darker and the air turned chilly. The fire crackled, casting dancing shadows across the trees. It felt cozy, and I remember thinking how perfect the moment was. We decided to stay up a little longer and enjoy the fire before calling it a night. Around 2 a.m., I realized I needed to use the bathroom. I told Mike I'd be back in a minute and grabbed my flashlight. The forest felt much darker when I left the light of the campfire. I walked a short distance into the trees, did my business, and headed back. But when I returned to the campsite, something was wrong. Mike wasn't there. His chair was empty, and the fire was still burning. The first, I thought he'd gone to the bathroom too, or maybe he was playing a prank on me. Mike! I called out, shining my flashlight around the campsite. No answer. I waited a few minutes, expecting him to jump out from behind a tree or something. But he didn't. A strange feeling started creeping over me, something between confusion and fear. I called his name again, louder this time. Still nothing. I grabbed my flashlight and started searching the area, thinking he couldn't have gone far. Mike, this isn't funny. Where are you? I walked in circles around the campsite, shining the beam of light into the trees. The forest was silent except for the crunch of leaves under my boots. No footsteps, no voices, nothing. After about 20 minutes of searching, I started to panic. Mike was nowhere to be found. I ran back to the campsite, hoping he'd come back while I was gone, but the scene hadn't changed. His chair was still empty, and the fire continued to crackle softly. That's when I noticed something strange. The fire was suddenly smaller, as if someone had thrown water on it. I hadn't done that, and Mike wouldn't have either, not without letting me know. Then I saw his shoes. They were sitting neatly by the tent, but Mike's backpack was missing. Why would he take his pack but leave his shoes? Something wasn't right. I stayed up all night, waiting by the fire and calling his name into the darkness. I didn't sleep for a second. Every sound in the woods, every rustle, every crack, made me jump. When the sun finally rose, I packed up our campsite and headed back to the car, hoping that maybe Mike had decided to head back on his own for some reason. It didn't make sense, but I was desperate to find him. When I got to the parking lot, the car was still there, just as we had left it. Mike wasn't. 
I tried calling him, but his phone went straight to voicemail. That's when I knew I had to report him missing. I went to the nearest ranger station and explained what happened. They took me seriously and sent out a search and rescue team. For days, they combed the area, searching every inch of the forest. But they didn't find anything. No signs of Mike. No clues. Nothing. It was like he had vanished into thin air. I kept going over that night in my head, trying to figure out what could have happened. Did he wander off and get lost? Was he attacked by an animal? Or was someone else out there with us? The idea of someone watching us from the shadows, waiting for the right moment to strike, made my skin crawl. It's been five years now, and I still don't have answers. Mike is still missing, and the search was called off long ago. His family is devastated, and I can't stop blaming myself. I don't go camping anymore. The woods, once a place of adventure and fun, now feel like a nightmare. Every time I close my eyes, I see that empty chair by the fire, and I wonder, where did Mike go? And will I ever know what happened that night?